tonight. Amen. We have our house prophet, Angela, that's going to be bringing the word. Come on up, Angela. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Okay, you can hear me? Yes, you can hear me? Okay, great. Wow, it's like dessert up in here. I mean, that was so sweet. So delicious. Um, I just thank you, Dave and Rick, for just setting the tone in here. And, and I really, I've got to honor Dave because Dave is so prophetic. He is such a prophetic worship leader. Um, he, he already preached part of what I'm going to say tonight. <laughs> but that's all right. That's all right. Um, I'm just grateful. Um, let, me, let me go to the Lord real quick. Father God, I just thank you so much for everybody that showed up tonight and for everybody that's online. I thank you, God, for the word that you've put in my heart. I thank you for the hearts that you have already tenderized tonight during worship, including my own. Thank you that you are a present God. You are a close, personal God. You are not distant. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Amen. So, in case nobody has reminded you today, I'm going to remind you that you are kingdom-minded sons and daughters of the Most High God. You are baptized in His Holy Spirit. You are full of His presence, and you carry revival yeah. in you. So, what I want to share tonight is kind of a new topic for me. Um, I recently heard a message that just sparked something in me. And the more I get into the subject, it just, it's, it just gets deeper and wider. And I don't think that I could have prepared a message to cover the topic in full. So tonight, my goal is to give you an introduction. It's to spark in you the flame that's been sparked in me by this particular subject. So I'm starting a journey, and I'm trying to get some people to come along with me. <laughs> Um, we're going to be interactive tonight. I'm going to ask questions and expect answers. Um, we're going to use our divine imaginations. We are going to practice thinking like God because we have the mind of Christ, right? Amen. Right. right. And so um, the imagination has gotten like hijacked by false religions, but it belongs to the Lord, and I'm, I'm going to encourage you and expect you all to think like your creative Father God in heaven, that you're going to remember that you have the mind of Christ, and we're, gonna, we're going to exercise those divine imaginations, and we're going to do a little bit of dreaming with God. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. So I want you to start by closing your eyes. Imagine that you are seeing into the year 2172, 150 years from now. What does the world look like? How does the atmosphere feel to you? How does the earth appear? What do the trees and the grass 
and the oceans and the buildings and the skies look? What does the church of Jesus look like? What does your family line look like? As you get these images and thoughts, I want you to make a mental note of them or even just jot them down, but I want you to remember what you see. Okay, now open your eyes. Did any of you have trouble imagining the year 2172? <laughs> just one. Okay, so how many of you actually got either just a snippet of a picture or a full picture or a video? How many of you saw something? That's awesome. That's awesome. So you want to know what this means and why I had you do it? Okay, too bad. You're going to have to wait. We're going to do it. I'm going to get back to it later. I want to know now who your favorite person of the Bible is. I mean, there's a lot of great ones, and maybe you have multiples, but who is your favorite? Like, who really spoke to you the most? And choose somebody that wasn't born of a virgin. Because, <laughs> like, you know, if this is kids, you know, Sunday school, it's like, Jesus! But I want you to, to pick someone that really inspired you that's not Jesus. So, who's got somebody in mind? Joshua. Joshua, okay. Isaiah. Isaiah. Joseph, David, John, Daniel, Deborah, Esther, Samuel, Elijah, Anne. We could go on and on because there's so many amazing people that are written about in the scriptures. But I would say that each of you chose a person who has somehow impacted you. Somehow their life impacted yours. Would you say that's true? Okay, great. I would also say that you chose a historical figure that has strengthened you, encouraged you. And I would even go so far as to say that you chose a person who deposited something into history specifically for you. Amen. Now, how did they do that? They did that because our God is omniscient. He's all-seeing and all-knowing. He has no beginning. He has no end. He stands outside of the timeline that we live in. He's eternal. And so he knows what we need and he made sure that those people's stories were kept in the bible to inspire and encourage us amen, amen. all right so those people that you mentioned i mean like i don't know when their birthday is i can't even tell you they're like we're talking thousands of years old thousands of years right? Those ancient ones left an inheritance for you, an inheritance for your faith, for my faith, and for the faith of everyone that came after them, an inheritance. They left a legacy. So, at the beginning, I mentioned that I had heard this message that really kind of sparked me. And the message was about legacy, and it inspired me to start thinking about leaving a legacy of my own. It inspired me to start thinking about leaving a kingdom legacy, a 100-year kingdom legacy. 
okay? Tonight, my goal is to get you to do the same thing, okay? Am I suggesting that we don't focus on the here and now in depositing anything here and now or in depositing anything into our children or grandchildren or the people that are coming up right next to us in history? Instead, just focusing on people that live 100 years from now? No, I'm not. I'm suggesting that we have the honor, the blessing, and the privilege and the duty to do both. That's, that's what our heroes in, in the scriptures did. They affected their day. They affected the next generation after them. And they've been affecting us these thousands of years. Right? Is it just for them? Are they the only ones that are supposed to be doing this? Are we part of the same kingdom? Are we part of the same God? Do we have the same Lord? We do. So I've brought three definitions of legacy with me that we're going to talk about. The first one is that legacy is the long-lasting impact of particular events or actions that took place in the past. Consider the 120 in the upper room who obeyed Jesus and waited for the promise. Did they have an impact on you? <laughs> they sure had an impact on me. And Peter actually talks about, about legacy in response to the day of Pentecost. In Acts 3, 24, he said, Every prophet from the time of Samuel onward has prophesied of these very days, and you are heirs of the prophecies and of the covenants God made with your fathers when he promised Abraham that your descendants will be a blessing to all the people of the earth. So there he's talking about how the prophets set the stage. They started it. And on the day of Pentecost, they became the recipients of that inheritance. And we're still inheriting from it. Not only did they impact the city, I mean, the city was crazy wild. They were Jews from all over everywhere. And things just got kind of chaotic. <laughs> but it went beyond that because the day of Pentecost is still hot to the touch for us, right? There's still fire in it, lots of fire, and the fire is building and it should continue to build. The second definition of legacy is something handed down from an ancestor to a predecessor. So how about 2 Kings chapter 2? And this is the story of Elijah passing on the mantle to Eli Elisha, right? So all of his authority, all of his power, everything that he did, he passed it on to Elisha. And Elisha gets this double portion and goes out and just does all this amazing stuff in the name of the Lord, right? So that's handing down something. Or 1 Chronicles 22 and 29. This is a pretty well-known story. It's about David. And, you know, David was such an amazing worshiper. And part of his legacy was the Psalms that he wrote. And, of course, slaying Goliath. I mean, just all of that speaks so much to us. But his heart for worship, his heart for the Lord was so amazing. And he had this passion, this burning in him to build a temple for the Lord. And the Lord told him, no. Like, I love your heart, but no. I'm going to give that to someone else to do. And you know what David did? David didn't 
say, he said, okay. And what did he do? He started planning. David started gathering resources, pulling gold together, and setting it aside so that he could hand it off to his son, King Solomon, so that Solomon could build what David had in his heart. He prepared, he ran his race, and he prepared for the next person, right? The third definition is a little bit different because, and I, I don't know that a lot of people really think about this one very much, um, because it has more of a world application, but, or definition, but it has a kingdom application. And this definition is, a legacy is an applicant to an educational institution, like a college, who is given special preference because a parent or relative attended that institution. Okay, so this is where we get to disciple in the spirit future generations. Because as we develop our relationship and our intimacy and our worship with the Lord, we are in the school of the Word of God. We are in the school of the Holy Spirit. We're in the school of the presence of the Lord. And we are constantly growing and learning and expanding and becoming bigger spiritually. So we attend that school of the kingdom and then we teach it. We, we teach it. We, we make a way for the next generation to come into that school of the kingdom and learn and grow and go further than we did. Um, I'm going to borrow an example um, that I heard from another minister, and this is what Dave uh, touched on a little bit already. Um, in a relay race, there are four runners, right? And the runners are not all equally fast. So the first runner is actually the second fastest. The second runner and third runner are the third and fourth fastest, right? And the last runner is the fastest runner. But the, the, the first runner, the second runner, the third runner, they don't just go, you know, the fourth guy, he's the fastest, I can just kind of coast. They run and they run hard. Dave talked about running the race and he talked about running hard. Just love how the Holy Spirit reinforces what he wants to say. So we're running this this race right and they the each runner gives everything they have they give everything they have because the faster and harder they run then that allows the last runner to go to start further to go further to be further ahead right to be further ahead and so legacy is kind of like that the lives in the Bible, the people in the Bible that inspire us, they ran first. And, and they ran hard. Um, in Luke 10, verse 24, it says, Many kings and prophets of old long to see the days of miracles that you have been favored to see, they would have given everything to hear the revelation you've been favored to hear. Yet they didn't get to see as much as a glimpse or hear even a whisper. Hebrews, you know, um, chapter 11 is just chock full of information about, about the people that went before us. It says... In chapter 11, these heroes all died clinging to their faith, not even receiving all that had been promised them, but they saw beyond the horizon to the fulfillment of the promises and gladly embraced it from afar. 
They all lived their lives on the earth as those who belonged to another realm. These were true heroes, commended for their faith, yet they lived in hope without receiving the fullness of what was promised to them. But now God has invited us to live in something better than what they had, faith's fullness. This is so that they could be brought to finished perfection alongside us. Now that right there is relay race language. When we, when we keep going, when the last runner runs, and I don't know who that's going to be, I don't know what generation or what year that's going to be, but when that last runner runs, everyone else on the relay team is going to be there to finish with him or her. Right? And that team all gets the prize. So why, why is it important to have a hundred year legacy? The Lord spoke to Chris Vallotton, a prophet and senior leader at Bethel, and told him this. If you don't have a vision for a generation you will never see, then revival will never last for more than one generation. Do you feel the weight of that statement? I mean, that is a heavy, like, wake-up word from the Lord. And we know, we talk about revival here all the time, and we, we talk about how revival is not meant to be an event. It's not meant to be a one-week or two-week or one-year or five-year thing. It's meant to be sustained. So the point the Lord is making is that we have to get a vision afar off, yeah. like, the, like the people of old did, and so into that so that revival can be sustained. We've got to run hard, run fast, so that the next person is in a good position to do their part of the race. We were left an in inheritance by those that came before us, and in turn, we have a duty to leave a legacy for those that come after us. We are kingdom people who believe that the increase of the government of God has no end. We are kingdom people that desire to see future generations go further than we do, right? So... Um, Chris Vallotton tells this story, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you. Um, he was laying on the floor of the prayer room at Bethel, and God took him into this vision. Um, so the Holy Spirit takes him 100 years into the future. He's in this huge, in the spirit, he's in this huge, beautiful, ornate, like, mansion. He, he can't quite put his finger on it. It's like a mansion, but like a castle. It's massive. And he's standing next to an old man. The old man's sitting in a chair. It's Thanksgiving. There's a bunch of children around the old man, and they're kind of half listening. They're playing and doing whatever. And the old man begins to muse and reflect upon the past. There are 60 to 70 people in the house. Big house. Women are in the kitchen and men are in the front room. Suddenly the old man's voice changes and everyone in the house stops talking and starts to gather around him. Children, teens, moms, dads, all around as he begins to recount the story of the family's life history. He lifts his hand and he says, all this. And instantly the Lord reveals to Chris, all this is meaning the wealth, all the royalty, all the nobility, the greatness, all of the influence that they have with God. 
So he says all of this, and he points up to a portrait above an enormous fireplace. I'm like, huge fireplace, big enough for people to stand inside it. And there's a portrait above the mantel. He says, all of this began with your great, great, great grandmother and grandfather. And Chris looks at the portrait, and as it comes into focus, he realizes it's a picture of him and his wife, Kathy. Then the vision ended. And the Lord told Chris, I want you to quit ministry and start building a legacy. That is so powerful. I want you to live for a generation you will never see. So what excites me about that is that the concept of banking something, of building something, of planting something for a generation I will never see gets me super like, wow, really? I can do that? I mean, like, we're co-heirs and we're co-laborers with Christ. He's asking us to consider co-laboring so far into the future for a generation that we won't even meet here on earth. That, that's the way of the Lord. It's all through the scripture. If you look at the scripture, everything is legacy. Everything is for now, for the next, and for far off. Everything. Every bit of it. There have been others since the scriptures that have left legacy too. Um, I immediately think of William Tyndale. He's one of my heroes of the faith. Um, he translated the Bible from the original Greek and Hebrew into English so that people could actually read the word for themselves and stand up against religious persecution and tyranny. Um, I think of Adoniram Judson. Does anybody know who Adoniram Judson is? <laughs> he was the first missionary sent out from the United States of America. And as the first, he was the pioneer. He plowed the way. The U.S. has a huge history of missions. We, we are one of the top mission-sending places in the world. And that man began it. That's legacy. I think of Amy Simple McPherson, um, man, I think of John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, Catherine Kuhlman, A.W. Tozer, Jack Hayford, Mother Teresa, the Moravians. They gave and left so much, right? Legacy is inside you. You were created with legacy. And that legacy is both for the generation that you are currently living in, it's for the next generation, and it's for many generations after. I don't know what your legacy is going to look like. I can tell you that there's only one David, there's only one Esther, there's only one Elijah. And mentioning their names is not so that we can compare ourselves to them and try to be them because you are uniquely you. You were made specifically for a purpose. The, the DNA of God that's in you, the, everything that he gave you is uniquely you. He wants you to be you and for you to fulfill your calling and leave the legacy that he has for you to leave. Right? If you think about what contribution to the kingdom really burns in your heart, like what things in the kingdom you really truly have a passion for, 
it's quite possible that your legacy is hiding somewhere in that. Maybe not, but quite possibly. And your legacy could be your children. It could be your children, your grandchildren, and if, if, if you don't have natural children, your spiritual children. And if you don't have spiritual children, you need to get with God and get you some. <laughs> So, I said that we were going to dream with God, and it's time. We're going to give the Holy Spirit like five to ten minutes, maybe longer, depending on what he does. And I'm going to have you guys get alone with him. You don't have to go anywhere. You can if you want to. You can just sit right where you're at. Um, but. I'm, we're going to revisit the year 2172, but first I, I want to pray over you. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would bring revelation, that you would bring excitement, that you would begin expanding legacy within the hearts of every person here. Show them, Lord, how to co-labor with you for generations that they'll never see. In Jesus' name. So again, you can stay where you're seated if you want, if you want to kneel or get on the floor or whatever you can, but I want you to close your eyes again. Let's see if your vision is different. It's the year 2172, 150 years from today. See what the Lord will show you. Memorize it. <laughs> <laughs>